Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Today, I want to just take a moment uh, to share with you. A couple weeks from now, we are going to have a marriage night. And that little video, fun video, is uh, just kind of help us to see how important it is for us to enjoy the space of marriage. Uh, a couple months ago, Pastor Chad had asked me, he goes, you know, Pastor Ron, what do you feel that is a unique, something that God's put inside of you that's that you just really want to make sure it gets outside of you. And, and so I spent some time praying about it. And, and to be honest with you, one of the most important things I feel that God has and put some intentionality in my life is marriage. I've been married for 36 years, and I work at it constantly. I'm very intentional in my thinking. Um, this morning, we were, I was actually had it, I forgot to get something out of my car, and then another person that was driving in to the um, parking lot was uh, admiring. I bought my wife a new car out there, and, uh, and so they, they stopped and said, well, Pastor Ron, how come that's her car, not your car? And I said, because I prefer my wife. I'd much rather see my wife looking hot and ready to go than caring less about what I'm driving in. And I think the biggest thing we realize is that, um, you know, marriage this is what it's about, is preferring one another. It's about um, learning how to, you know, realize what a treasure. Marriage is a treasure, and I know that so many people are really struggling. So if you are in marriage right now, or maybe you're contemplating, thinking about getting married, or, or maybe you're in, a, you know, in this space where, you know, that you've been, well, I've been married for so long. I've been married longer than you, Pastor Ron. Well, you know, I'm not here. We're not here to compare um, uh, each other. What we're here to do is, it's a covenant we made before God, and let's learn how to do it better together. And so we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some food. We got child care that's going to be here that, that evening. We got a panel discussion. It's just going to be, we're just going to have a, a great time learning how and figuring out, you know, what, what has God put in our life and how to do it better. And you can um, go online and go to our calendar and you can sign up and register. And you can also go to our app and you can get through the calendar and you can sign up and register that way too. Well, today I want to talk to you about Easter, and I'm going to uh, kind of share it from maybe a di little bit different perspective. The Holy Spirit was really kind of talking to me this last uh, month here, and that so many of us, when we think about Jesus, we think about Jesus on this earth, and then he was here, and then he was out of here, and then we think, well, yeah, when he was out of here was that thing we called resurrection, and what I want to do is I want to share with you that Jesus was here way before he was here. In fact, there's a reason why the, the wise men, you know, came to visit and the angels came to visit and they were worshiping, you know, because honestly, they were worshiping the space of the plan that God had. And that the plan has been this. Jesus was a king before he came here. Jesus was a king while he was here. And he is a king after he left here. And the purpose of his kingdom and this kingship wasn't because, you know, he was trying to prove something. Look, I'm going to be king. It was so that you could be invited for him to be your king. That was the whole point. So that you could invite, you could have the opportunity to invite Jesus to be your king. The whole, all heavens knew that he was a king. And many people on the earth knew that he was a king. Many of them didn't. And you know what? And all those in heaven right now can certainly see that he's always been a king. But the question is, is he your king? That's the question. That's the space of understanding when we could realize that he wants to be our king. He went through so much agonizing pain so that he could, so you could make the choice for him to be your king. And I don't make that lightly because it's a it's a really a difficulty because you can't come to God with your brain. You can't. You can't make sense of it. It doesn't make any sense. Because it's not supposed to be, because God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the only way you're going to engage God is from your heart. You know, the longest journey that you'll ever have is from your head to your heart. And so many of us don't make the journey. You say, well, Pastor Ron, well, I don't really understand. I don't really get it. Well, I mean, if, if God wants to come and live inside of my life and the power of his presence wants to come and live in my life, why am I really struggling with all these situations and scenarios in my life? Because you can resist him, you can grieve him, and you can quench him. It's very clear that mankind has constantly struggled 
with the space of Jesus being our king. It's a struggle. In fact, we're going to uh, read from John chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles or you have your smart device, um, I highly recommend that you bring uh, one or the other so you can write notes in it so that you can refer to it. Let me just tell you something. Some of the greatest experiences I had were when I wasn't a pastor. And I remember working at Steelcase Inc. And I would go there and I would have a, a, I would come to on Monday uh, morning morning and I would meet one of my best friends. He went to um, Assembly of God Church. I went to uh, Resurrection Life Church in Grand, in Grand, and we would compare notes. So he'd get his notes out, and then I'd get my notes out. And so what happened for, for me and for him is we went to two different services every week. I learned what he learned from God in his service, and he learned from what I learned in my service. And we just compared notes, and we prayed together. And I mean, that's, a, that's a, uh, Bob DeLue. It's a, you know, kind of a long little story and journey. But I want to share with you, I think it's so important that we take notes. That's why I have them written notes for you. Um, that's why we write them out there. In fact, today is a little bit more than normal. Normally, there's only like three or four points. Well, today we have like eight. Um, I'm not asking you to memorize these points um, no, God's not asking you. If you could get just one thing today and hold on to it and allow God to do some work inside of your life, that your tomorrows will be different than your today's. Because that's the power of God that gets inside of us. His power that gets inside of us. John chapter 20, reading the time. And again, I just kind of give you a little bit of uh, historical um, history here. What happened was is that when Jesus died and resurrected, he stayed on this earth for 40 days. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have been my plan. I mean, if I had been just thrown on the cross, ridiculed, mocked, spit on, and laughed and made a mockery out of, I think I would have wanted to go where I felt like a king. Because that's, after all, I was a, a king. Not to be, and, and then I was mocked. On that cross, I was mocked as a king of the Jews. I think I'd say, hey, you know what, Sinai, see y'all. But Jesus came here. The reason he came here was so that he could be our king. And so for 40 days, he connected with people that he had connection with before. In fact, we find that he, we know that scripturally there are 10 different times that he had inter, you know, intersections with his disciples and others, all right? One of them is we're, we're about to, to record right now. In fact, actually two of them are really kind of found in this particular passage, all right? John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they'll be forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Through, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said, Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray. Father, what I, don't put my, I don't judge Thomas because there's so many times in my own personal life I have doubts. Not that I want them there, but God, those things just seem to rise up. And Lord, I pray that this morning that we could be loosened. Lord, that doubts would no longer be a detour, a distraction 
But God, I pray that we would have faith or we would have belief inside of us. That we would recognize who you are as our king. And as our king, that you've given us a mission. That you've sent us out as messengers. And that you, Lord God, have empowered us. You've given us, Lord God, authority. I pray that we would exercise that authority in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You know, in, uh, in the very beginning, we're going to turn there um, pretty uh, quick here. In the very beginning, Jesus had basically given Adam and Eve authority. And in that space, he only gave them really two things to do. Two words. And he said, tend it and keep it. Tend to it, which means, for instance, let's think about marriage. Tend to your marriage. Make sure it's a priority and keep it. All right? How about parenting? Tend to your parenting and keep it. All right? So you say, well, that seems so, you know, simple. Was it? Because then a serpent came in the space of their life. We know it to be Lucifer who took on this body form, this avatar of, of a body, and, and, you know, and then deceived Adam and Eve, and they didn't keep what God gave them. In fact, that's what we know of, is all of a sudden in that space, they gave leadership or kingship of their heart and bowed or served the serpent. So Jesus came back here on this earth died on that cross so he could take those keys back from Lucifer, or we know him in Genesis, as the serpent. That's really the message why Jesus came. He was always a king, though, but he wasn't necessarily your king. And what happens is, is that it's, we have to recognize that this isn't something that we mentally think about. This is something where our heart surrenders to. In fact, one day the Bible says that every single person, whether they want to or not, will bow and prostrate themselves to the king. Read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're not going to turn there right now, but it says that all dominion, all authority, everything that breathes, everything that moves, principalities, powers, the enemy realm as well as the human realm will come before the throne room of Jesus and prostrate themselves. To the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, Jesus invites us into that space, not because we have to. I mean, I don't want to tell my kids what they have to do. I would love them to do it because they want to do it. That's with the same thing when it comes down to worship. God doesn't want to tell you to worship Him. One day, everybody will worship, period, or you can do it because you want to. One day, you know, where God goes over there, you can do, you can give because you have to give, or you can want to give. And that's the difference. You know? And so Satan came as a serpent, and you know what happened is Adam and Eve didn't keep what God had given them. We're going to be learning more about this in the weeks to come. I have a message series on, you know, basically working through the nonsense. I have another one on the prayer series, what God's given us. But there's a thing that God has been just working in my heart about the authority that we believers have. And not to be exercising it like some domineering thing so that we can get more or we can... Tip. No, what it is is that God has given us a space. He's given us life with Him. And that when we have that, that we should tend it and keep it. For instance, you may think it's really easy for me to get in God's presence when we're here. It's not. The reason is, is I can be so distracted because I'm the pastor here and I'm, an, I'm leader. And so I'm thinking about what's the praise and worship doing? What's the offering doing? What is the lights doing? What's the sound doing? And I have to really, I struggle as the shepherd of this house, being distracted. Kind of like you parents sometimes, and all of a sudden your kid, you know, you, you can go over there and maybe you're, you have your kids and, and, you know, and all of a sudden they're just, they're just going, they're having them one of those crazy moments. And, you know, we, and we always blame it on sugar, but the bottom line is kids are crazy. 
Amen? <laughs> right? And the Bible says that. Foolishness is bound up in a child. Okay? And so what happens is all of a sudden we get so distracted and sometimes in the midst of that distraction we don't realize the honor and the value it is to be a parent. That the child next to you is going to live forever. And God gave you the opportunity to lead that child to eternity. Seriously, can there be anything cooler than that? But we get so distracted, right? All of a sudden, because all of a sudden the crazy is going on. Or maybe all of a sudden, you know, we get distracted in, in other areas, whether it be our marriage or our relationship with God. I just want to share with you as, as your pastor, I can get, so I have to intentionally get in the space, say, God, I love you. I worship you. Jesus, you are my king. You are, I acknowledge you as my master. Not of something that happened 38 years ago. Lord, right now, you're my king. And Lord, I'm sorry for those times where I get so distracted. You deserve better. As your king, as your, you being my king and as your son, I can really sometimes miss the moment. I am truly sorry for that. Help me to stay true to you. God, I'm even sorry that i got to ask you to help me in this. When you're so much more worthy of the space of my attention, God, I'm sorry that attention deficit isn't just something that's a human thing. God, I got it spiritually. I can truly be attention deficit in the things that really, really matter. And I know that I'm speaking to all of you because I know you're just like me. Here's the cool thing about God is that as you convey your heart like that, God loves you. He already knows that. And as you confess your faults unto your Lord and your Savior, all of a sudden, here's the thing is, is that you're unloading and God's uploading. You're downloading and God is uploading. All right, point number one I want to share with you. We're just going to get kind of what is Easter and then we're going to talk about Jesus on this earth. And then we're going to talk about you. All right? That's how we're going to break it out. Number one, Easter is a special day in which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. Well, is it? Is it something we just mentally think about and we get all dressed up about? I remember I was with a, um, a banker this week, and, and they were saying, hey, it's a big, big day for you, isn't it? Big day for this week. I go, I says, every day is Easter with Jesus. Every day he's resurrected in my heart. Amen? And so, but her picture of Easter was, oh, my little girl gets to get, you know, that little, little dressy and gets all dressed up. And, and her, her, her picture of Easter was, you know, dress day. It was a dress up day. And to me, Easter isn't, you know, and that's cute. I, I got all my, my little granddaughters are so cute, you know, and, and that's, that's it's wonderful. But Easter isn't about what I do. It's about what he's done. Amen? Two, Easter celebrates victory, but it came after a very sacrificial death. In fact, during our song um, in our worship set, you're going to see some of that. Number three, Easter is the final chapter of Jesus on earth. Easter celebrates his return to kingship in heaven. He was a king before he came here. He was a king on this earth, and he was a king after he left here. He's always been a, he's always been a king, but is he your king. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. You can't get too much you know, far, farther in the beginning, right? Here's Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, them having dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and the cattle, over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. Wouldn't it be great if Adam and Eve took care of the creep that came in the garden? You and I would have a much different worship service right now. So when the creep came in the garden, he should have said, get out, devil. Get out, serpent. You have no place in here. You're not talking to my gal. You're not talking to me. You got nothing good to say, so I'm not listening. But that's not what happened, is it? They listened. And sometimes we, we, can th we don't realize that the creepy thing gets in our, you know, on our phone. And all of a sudden we're watching things and listening to things we ought not watch and see. How in the world did the creepy thing get there? Well, that creeps get there. that's what creeps are. They creep into things. So your job is to get rid of the, well, man, you just, we can go home now. Your job is to get rid of the creeps. 
You know, here's the thing is, what if you were so good at getting rid of the creeps for your life that you began to pray to get rid of the creeps in other people's lives? Man, we'd have revival. We'd start seeing churches get filled because we are no longer taking care of the thoughts, just our thoughts that we're dealing with. We're starting to help people deal with the thoughts that they're dealing with. Colossians 1, verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of over all creation. For by him, Jesus... All things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So you can't, basically Jesus was here in the beginning when it said, let us make man in our own image. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit making man and woman in his image. So Jesus was here way before he showed up as a baby. He was a king before he was a baby. So when you get your picture of Jesus as a baby, that was only Jesus' time on this earth so that you could choose him to be your dad. You're getting it. He lived this earthly life so that you would have the privilege and the honor to surrender your life to him. That was the whole point of it. John chapter 18, there's a, a, a moment where Pilate is bringing out these accusations and he speaks about Jesus in this way. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king? Jesus answered, said, you are rightly saying that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. All right, we've proven, or we've tried to prove to you that Jesus was a king before he came on this earth. He was a king. Now we're going to talk about him, a king on this earth, and then we're going to talk about his kingdom afterwards. Number four, point number four. Jesus as the Son of God brought blessings on earth. Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, 14. Here's Jesus taking care of babies. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and prayed for them. But the disciples rebuked them. The disciples thought there's got to be something better for Jesus to do than this right now. And Jesus goes, no, there isn't. Jesus says, let these little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So as Jesus was a king on this earth, he was touching babies. Point number five. Jesus, the son of God, brought healing on this earth. So Jesus is a king on this earth. He brought, he touched babies, and now he's bringing healing. Matthew 8, verse 3. Jesus reached out his hand, touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. So now we have two things that Jesus did on this earth. He was touching babies. He was healing. As the Son of God, he was touching babies. He was healing. Point number six. Jesus, the Son of God, served. John 13, 3-5, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things underneath his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured out water from a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around them. Three things we see Jesus did as a king. He touched babies. He healed and now we see served. Point number seven. Jesus as a son of God brought forgiveness. 1 Peter 3.18. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So, four things. And I know that Jesus did many more of these things, but here's four main things that Jesus as a son of God did on earth. One, we know, he touched babies. God, as we're his children, we're the sons and daughters of God, he wants you to bless kids. That is a godly thing to do, and that is to bless kids, touch kids. Two, he came here to serve. We know that he came here to serve. We know that he came here to forgive. We know that he came here to heal. So I share all this because we're about ready to close. Point number eight. 
Most people don't doubt what Jesus did as the Son of God. Most of you, if I got a microphone and I asked you, put a microphone in front of your face, what did God do? You go, man, I, you know, Pastor, I know that God healed people. I know, that he, I know that he loved babies. I know that he served. I know that he went out and forgave others. I know that he did, but what, do you know what he's doing in you? What if Jesus were to get that microphone and put it and says, what are you doing with it? Are you tending it and keeping it? Are you tending it and keeping what God has put inside of you? Philippians, I'm sorry, I'll finish with a point. Most people don't doubt what Jesus did as the Son of God on earth. What they doubt is what they can do in his same resurrection power. They doubt, which means they're filled with wonder, they're filled with bewilderment, they're filled with confusion. They don't realize that the power that Jesus Gave them. By the way, this power is from the beginning. God, we read it in Genesis chapter 1. God gave all this power and dominion to Adam and Eve. And he didn't tend it and keep it. And therefore we're in the mess we're in today. And Jesus had to come on the cross and get the keys back from the enemy so that he could be your king. Now as your king... Jesus goes back again. History repeats itself and says, I am now your king, Jesus goes. You are my sons and my daughters. Now as my sons and my daughters, what God is asking you, because you're of, of a different kingdom, look what Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says to you. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Isn't it interesting? This is the very thing that, that was said of Jesus. He did everything that pleased the Father. How many want to please God? The way to please God is through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Allowing the voice, allowing the presence, allowing the love to come inside of your life. Now, I, I got, I'm going to do something a little different today. Some of you, maybe this is the first time you've ever heard a message like this. Or others, maybe that you're coming into the space where you're in, like Thomas. Unless I see it, I am not going to believe it. I want to share with you that um, I get it. You know, I, didn't, I never thought when I was growing up that I was going to be a preacher. That was not what I thought was going to be the course of my life at all. And yet... God had inside of his plan, this is what I was going to be. So much so that um, my mother-in-law told my wife, he said, you're going to marry a preacher or a missionary. And my wife didn't want to marry a preacher or a missionary. In fact, she was dating anything but. And so because her experience was is that that they were just people that, I, I don't know, I don't know, it wasn't good. I'll just say that. And to be honest with you, I was, at that point, I was seeking. I was a young man seeking. And I had thought I'd come to that space where just, that God is just a, a God that's, I don't know, just, he's not tangible. He's not touchable. But he is. He's so tangible and touchable that he sent his son to do it. Now, I didn't really understand how or what, but I found that it's not just in some, you know, some kind of mythology or church attendance. It's when you just want to get real with God. And my reality with God came at, I just, just went through a boat crash, thought I was going to die. Hit a bridge in my boat. And I, and I will never forget the sinking feeling inside of my heart that I was going to hell. Who told you? The presence of not having God there is what told me. That I almost died and it wasn't a light that I was seeing that was going up. It felt dark going down. And I remember just the saving power of something that grabbed hold of my life and awoke me 
And I remember going to a, a church I'd never gone to in my whole life. Maybe that's you here right now. Maybe that's watching you online. You're saying, man, I've never been to a church like this. It's just being real with God. And I never remember the pastor invited people. And he invited people up. And I was, it was a balcony. It was a large church. I think it was like 1,500 seats. And I was up on the balcony because I got there late or later than I should have, I guess. And I remember grabbing Brenda, who was my fiance at the time. And the pastor says, if you, you just want to come to know God. And I just, I grabbed Brenda and I went to the aisle. And I didn't know what God did with her. All I knew was what God did to me. I said, God, if you're for real, if you're really there, God, you got to give me a relationship, a love for my father. And what had happened in my life is my father and I, my biological father and I, I had grown distant. And if my father's watching this, he's never even heard it. I'm sorry for not sharing this with him. But I wanted something that was real. And what had happened was him and I had a pretty good relationship. And then I started courting Brenda and we just grew distant. And I, I just didn't know how to make it better. Wasn't good at it. I said, God, if you're for real, would you please heal that relationship? And as God is my witness, God's bigger and more powerful, he healed that relationship. And you know where he healed it? In me. He healed it in my earthly relationship, in my heavenly relationship. And God came real in my life that morning. So I don't know where you're at with Jesus but it's not about coming to a church for attendance. It's not about, you know, having a, you know, an, an Easter, you know, um, moment where well, I just come to church because it's Easter. It's personal. And I believe God wants a personal relationship with every person in this room and even those outside this room right now. God so loved the world that he gave his own son, Jesus, to die on that cross for Ron Rands and for you. And when you see that cross, do you see your name on that? Because that cross is where I belonged. Not Jesus. And he got up and hung up on that cross and saw me. He said, son, I forgive you. I love you. Would you please come into my, come into my, my family? And I know what it's like to adopt. I've adopted three wonderful girls. And that's what God did. He adopted me in. I was a hot mess. And he didn't look at all the messiness I was. He goes, come to me, son. And I came, tears and brokenness. Didn't have anything really other than to give of myself. And that's all God wanted was me. You know what's funny? That's all I still got. Yeah, maybe I'm more polished Maybe I can pray a little better than I used to pray. Maybe I've got some things that are going, you know, in, in God's corner. But the truth is, Isaiah 66, the last chapter in a great man named Isaiah, said this, what could I ever do that would impress God? The answer is nothing. There's nothing I could do. On my best day, it wouldn't impress heaven. But on this thing, God says, on a broken and a contrite heart, every one of you can have that with God. You can't impress God. Not one person in this room is ever going to get up in front of God and say, I did it. I impressed you. But you can come to him with a broken and a contrite heart. I have seen people where their marriages fell apart come to Jesus. I've seen people like myself who had a really bad accident, should have, even almost should have died, come to God. I've seen other young people that didn't have anything going on, but God is just calling, ring, ring. And he's knocking on their heart. For God so loved the world, he didn't so love and have to get you in a certain little box so he could talk to you. He loves you right where you're at. And all he's asking you to just love him back. He wants to be your king. By the way, you don't vote him in. 
He's not the president. He's the king. And he has a kingdom. I know it's a lot different for all of us who grew up in this crazy free country, right? But he's a king. And I need to surrender. And so do you. Well, Father, I thank you for this moment. We'll never have it again. But Lord, is in the space of presence of who you are, Jesus, being a king that you are. You are a king from the very beginning. In you, all things that were created were created in you and for you. And then you came on this earth being the king that you are. And you chose to come like a child with such humility and then to be brutally beaten and hang, hung on a cross for my sin, for our sin. You chose that because love compelled you to do it. God, I pray that that same love that would come inside of our hearts would compel us to come to you, to seek you while you may be found. Draw near unto you as you've drawn near to us. If you're here this afternoon, whether you're watching, whether you're present here, God's knocking on hearts. Whether it's maybe coming back to Him or whether it's just this, this endless search you have, there's got to be more to God than what you've experienced. Let me tell you there is. He is a treasure that you'll never stop seeking after. And His presence in your life is peace. I love how He said to disciples, peace. What a space we need right now when there's so much anxiety. And God's knocking on your heart right now. I want you to pray, pray this prayer with me right now. In fact, church, would you please pray with them? Say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I come to you in full surrender. Here I am. I'm all yours. I ask for my sins to be forgiven. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you lead me in the days to come. I am all yours. You are my king. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and worship our king today.